Hi everyone, I'm Scott Schneider and this is Stereo Niche. Um, this is not a review uh, like all my other videos, um, but uh, more so a discussion. And um, it's because I received a pretty lengthy uh, list of comments and questions um, in, in, um, one of, from one of the videos. And uh, so I thought, and, and they're applicable, I think a lot of people have similar questions. So. I thought instead of writing up an answer uh, that I would just do a quick video and, and cover these because I think they're questions that probably many people uh, that see this channel probably have. Um, so it comes from uh, the YouTube uh, name Sides Up. So if I, I wish I had your real name, I would say that. But uh, thanks for the, uh, the questions. Uh, was well thought out. Lots of good comments here and I'll try to, to cover all of them. And if I miss anything, um, I'll try to come back and summarize it uh, online. So it's, your question is, do, did, I, did I get all of this equipment? Um, did I plan on it or was it my, uh, did it happen because I had, I was trying to, to always do a one-upmanship and try to improve my sound in pursuit of you know, the, the perfect audio system? So it's a great question. And, um, and then secondly, did I seek out individual pieces or did I, did I find them randomly? So uh, let's start out with the first one. So did I uh, mass it um, on purpose? Uh, well, I'm a collector at heart. And uh, so, so that's where it started. Um, when I was in uh, gra small grade school, elementary school, I uh, started collecting comic books. And in the 70s, I had amassed thousands of them. Now, of course, I had you know, help from my parents. Uh, who are helping me, it started out with a, a, uh, a, a, a collection of several hundred books. They just happened to have been all of the Marvel comics from the 60s. And um, from there, I started collecting in earnest. And um, by the time I was uh, just about to go to high school, I had probably uh, four to 5,000 books. Unfortunately, we had a house fire. And uh, the vast majority of them burned up, you know, being the pulp that they were. They were uh, quite flammable, uh, sadly. And, uh, and I lost them. Um, we did get insurance money uh, for them. It helped pay for the repairs on the house. So, you know, it was a pretty good, you know, story uh, in a story to help, you know, with the family. But it, um, you know, I, I found something in that, uh, uh, that hobby and collecting that I very much enjoyed. But I went off to college after that, had no time, no money, no space to collect anything. And then I uh, graduated and after that, uh, I moved around a lot. So again, couldn't, uh, couldn't start collecting anything at the time. Although I did start uh, to collect, I collected model cars. I was sort of at that time into convertibles. I had a convertible as a young man and I started collecting uh, you know, model cars that were convertible. They're small easy enough to uh, move around, you know, as I moved. So that, I kind of kept, you know, doing a little bit of collecting, but nothing, um, you know, in a big way. Well, then I eventually got married. And uh, so after I graduated, um, my first thing, the first big purchase that I did was probably like many of us, uh, males anyway, we like our stereos. And so at that time was the late 80s and uh, I put a budget together, the best budget I could afford, and went out and got my first home stereo. Um, did all the research I could, et cetera, and um, started there, and I, and I started putting my money into media and buying albums, um, CDs mostly. Uh, so that was something I did for many years, and then eventually I got married. Well, you know, it's a very common story. I've run across it many times. Uh, once you get married, you know, your priorities change. Mine did as well. I had children and, and after that, um, I didn't collect anything, but some years into it, I always have work from home. So I've had a home office. And um, I actually mentioned some of this in uh, one of the other videos about the first stereo I bought. But um, one day I realized that I really didn't take the time to listen to music anymore. And it was that realization that sort of got me going again about getting a stereo. So while I was sort of having those thoughts, I thought, I thought about all of the old stereos that I used to drool over 
uh, in the 70s when I was a, you know, a, a child, basically. Uh, so that got me into pursuit of a vintage stereo. And at that time, we were in a different home, and uh, I didn't have the space. I had uh, my office, I had the living room, and I had uh, the garage. And that was it. I didn't have any extra space you know, to do anything like collecting. But uh, nonetheless, I did start buying things, and I would repair them. And as I repaired them, sort of, I either decided to keep it or I had to sell something. And so uh, that was the rotation. I would continue to buy something, fix it, you know, not always fix it or clean it up, whatever the situation was, listen to it. And then I would either keep it or pass it on. So it was because I didn't have the space, but we moved and uh, we moved to a different location uh, in the countryside. And it just so happened that the location we bought uh, which I'm on several acres, uh, happen to have a commercial cabinet workshop on the property. So I have more cabinet workshop floor space than I have home. And it is separate from my home, by the way. Uh, so that enabled me to have the space. And so with the space, I could then not worry about, you know, putting things on, you know, in closets and inside the house and clutter up the house. Uh, which is, you know, what many people would rightfully think of as a hoarder. So uh, I'm very much in control of my, you know, my collecting. And that's why it's, you know, set up and that's why it's on display. So, uh, so that's how I got started. And um, so when I was, you asked about, uh, did I find stuff randomly or do I seek things out? Um, initial, initially, I did buy some things when I was just starting out. I bought them online and I uh, would have them shipped to me. And the very first couple of times that I tried that, the people I bought them from didn't know how to properly pack them and they showed up broken. In fact, I had a turntable that was literally in pieces. So at, after that, I just, even though I got refunds and et cetera, um, I decided any purchase would be in person. And every piece I bought since then, I have gone to buy it. And I have traveled very far uh, to find it. Uh, the furthest I've ever gone to is, uh, or traveled to and back, is uh, Idaho, which was, is across the country. I'm in North Carolina. So it took me three days to drive it all the way across the country. So, you know, I will go to, uh, if it's something I'm interested in, I will go to links to obtain it. Um, so that's how it started, and, uh, and, and that's how it's been ever since. And uh, at this point in time, I have, you know, hundreds of units of different things. And so I've decided to uh, start sharing that online in this channel. Um, so you went on and uh, had some great comments here about some other things that uh, I used to do as well. Um, you mentioned the annual audio magazines that would list a directory of all the units and all the models that came out that year. I'm right there with you. I would buy those and I kept them for, for a very long time and I would you know go through them and and uh, look up every manufacturer and all the different models that they had. Um, I did that more so, I, I was, you know, I think every, most young men are at some point in, into cars, you know, it's, you know a, a bit, but I was always more so into audio. And so I would, you know, get the uh, annual directory and the guides and that would, that would list everything and uh, go through it as well uh, and drool over things and think, you know, maybe I'll get something like that one day. Um, that is also the time frame. Yes, you mentioned the, uh, that celebrities would endorse products back then. We would see them in the advertisements. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, Duke Ellington and the Allman Brothers. I remember the Allman Brothers uh, ads and, you know, the Pioneer as well. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was quite a long, it was quite a time. I, to me, that's the golden era of audio. Uh, the audio, the stereo system was the center of our entertainment up, you know, for, for that many decades. Only with the advent of the computer did we start taking our attention span away from, you know, the music. But, you know, I think people in my age group and, and, and older and, and, and maybe a little bit younger, uh, that is, uh, we remember that time when turning the music on meant it was time to gather around and, you know, and have a good time. And that, that's what, uh, what I sort of draw on every time I put a music, you know, an album on or any music, I'm reliving that, you know, experience. And so 
artists, you know, knew that that was the center, there, there were entertainers. So they were participating in, you know, in the market in a way by helping uh, to advertise, you know, the stereo. And I, I miss that as well. Um, oh, you're asking about uh, speaker design, uh, in essence, how the, the change from, or, or, or did, did, did we move from having many drivers into having fewer drivers today? Uh, not really. Um, I think what's changed, uh, so there are a few things here. Um, the, oh, the perfect speaker would be a single driver that could cover the entire spectrum of, uh, you know, sound. And uh, that, to the, you know, that to me, that, that speaker doesn't exist. No, no one's designed a speaker that can do everything. Um, what they try to do at best is put multiple drivers in a single source point and, and, and try to do it that way. But uh, coaxials, you know, um, from Tannoy are one good example. But uh, there's always com there were always compromises in, in a speaker. Um, until we figure out a way to, you know, have one speaker that can cover the entire spectrum, uh, there's somewhat of a compromise in every speaker that, you know, has been designed. But was it a methodology early on uh, to have many drivers? Not really. Uh, there were some, um, I'll say, marketing efforts to throw a lot of drivers into a speaker, and um, we tend to call that uh, kabuki. Uh, which is mean just means too much or too many, I think. But in essence, it was a marketing effort to make the buyer think that because it had all these drivers, it must be really good, um, which isn't true uh, or not necessarily true. You can certainly design a driver, uh, a speaker that has a lot of drivers. That's good, but there were a lot of marketing efforts uh, just to persuade them that that it was better. The scene in uh, there's a scene in Risk. Uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, I think, is a kind of a good example of that. But uh, designers still, uh, there were plenty of two ways. Uh, there were plenty of, of single drivers uh, um, uh, back in the day that uh, tried to cover, you know, the full spectrum. And there were many, I think most of the early speakers, I think they st still tended to be two or three way. But today, the, em the emphasis is more on smaller drivers. And I think that's part of part of the reason is because of the consumer taste. Consumer tastes have changed, and uh, they're just responding to that by trying to make a smaller speaker, a smaller footprint, uh, to fit into the room. Much different than when we were young, and this, the, this, the vintage systems back then were, as we say, meant, meant to be seen. They were part of the room and part of the furniture, so uh, the designers, you know, could take liberty with that and design a bigger box and put nice wood veneers on them because. Uh, they knew they were going to be seen in the room. So consumer tastes have changed over the years, and uh, engineers are primarily just responding to that. Um, let's see. Oh, yes. You mentioned here that uh, we used to see stereos in, in television uh, shows and uh, movies. And, uh, yeah, but it's because they were setting up those rooms to look like our homes and, um, you know, we we had stereos in our in our homes in our living rooms and so they did that uh, on the shows as well. I miss that too. Uh, any any time an old show comes on and um, there's a stereo in there, uh, I'm you know if it's a something I can freeze, I will freeze it to you know find out or try to find out anyway what kind of stereo is it. Just fun fun hobby. Um, and you could buy kits. Yes, you could buy kits where you could build them at home. These were a little bit before my time. I don't think they were very as popular, you know, when I was sort of becoming a teenager. But they were certainly uh, from Heathkit, uh, Dynaco. Uh, certainly had those kits, and you know, you could sit down with your dad and put those things together, and and uh, you know, do the do the physical labor yourself, and you know, smell the the soldering iron and, and you know, put those things together with great instructions and, and build your own system. Yeah, that's, um, you know, that was kind of cool. Now it's, uh, or for a while anyway, build your own computer. And, uh, you know, now it's, I guess, build your own drone or something. I'm not sure. But, you know, the, the, it's just the, uh, the difference in technology and focus. It, it, we've changed and uh, we are on to different things. Um, but those were some, uh, you know, some definitely some good times. And then um, you put a great list together of things that you would like to own. And I went through it. Uh, there are about 40, 40 things here. And I went through it and I owned 
Uh, I own or have owned two of them. I have a very substantial collection and I've only owned two of the things that you just listed here. And so, I, and I would like to have heard or have, you know, any, all of these, you mentioned some great things. It just, the point is that there's a lot of gear. We went through decades of fantastic gear being made by a lot of manufacturers. And, you know, even though I have a lot of gear, I've only scratched the surface and I still have that curiosity to always, you know, hear the next thing on it. It is the collector in me that, you know, drives that. And any collector would want to have one of everything if, uh, if, if, if possible. That's just our nature. And, um, you know, uh, I, I've, I've yet to run across any Rogers. Um, I would love to, to have an Oracle. Uh, that's about a, one of the most famous turntables, right? And um, Mariah Speakers. Uh, Fusilier, there's lots of names on here um, that, you know, I, I would love to uh, say that I've had them. The Sony SSM9, you know, who wouldn't want that piece of art, you know, in their collection, you know, and in their system at some point. Um, lots of great things here, um, and I would certainly love to try them all. The Sakira Met, that uh, speaker is one that I would love to find. I've, I heard them in college. A college friend of mine had a set. And I've never forgot them, and uh, would love to love to find a set. I just haven't ran across them. You know, again, it's I do find things at random. It, I don't seek them out. It's what I can find, and I can obtain uh, myself. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of cool things here. Uh, the Baron from uh, KLH, for example. So, thank you so much for the uh, for the questions and the comments here. Um, I hope I address them. And uh, if anyone else has any other questions, you know, please feel free to chime in. If you're a collector of anything else, you know, let me know. I, uh, you know, it's a, there are, I don't, I wish I, I haven't seen a statistic, but I would like to know what are the, what's the percentage of the population that are collectors? You know, I, I don't know. I've known a lot of collectors of different things over the years. Um, and uh, it's interesting that the, one of the things I've noticed, something about audio for some reason uh, you can say you collect art and you could have a hundred pieces of art and no one will say anything. You have a, you could car, be a car collector and uh, have a ton of cars and for some reason, you know, no one says, well, you can only drive just one, you know. Uh, but, for, but when it comes to audio, uh, I, I, I hear it more than anything else is that, you know, well, you can only listen to one stereo, you know, and, and uh, what are you going to, who, who can listen to it sitting on the shelf, you know, those kind of things. But um, but it's it's still collecting nonetheless, and uh, I enjoy it um, uh, from all aspects. Um, it's just fun, you know, for me. Um, I'm sure that uh, if you're a collector at heart, you understand. Uh, but uh, for me, it um, keeps me sane. It uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that that go on with it. Uh, by the way, it isn't just you know sitting on the shelf. Uh, almost you know every piece is going to need some kind of attention some restoration, something, uh, that, and I enjoy that part of it too. Now I can't do the technical stuff. I have a tech for that, but, um, certainly, you know, speakers that need refoaming or refinishing or, you know, some amps that, uh, or tuners and whatever that need uh, relamping and, you know, basic things like that, cleaning the pots, you know, all of that, uh, I find fun. Um, there's one or two that, are not fun to get into that probably don't fit that category, but uh, for the most part, uh, you know, it's fun. And so, uh, so if you, if you're like a car collector and if you don't enjoy getting under the hood and, you know, digging into the engine, then you're probably not a car collector, but uh, you know, same thing with uh, just about, you know, any other category. So anyway, I thank you again for the uh, comments and uh, please chime into the conversation. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you next time.